now correct yeah yeah i think that yes. for that the only solution is uh, i mean even full screen doesn't fully solve the problem i think no correct yeah yeah i think that yes. for that the only solution is uh, so but then even with that even was i don't know how to see the chat. yeah yeah correct no sorry what wish you yeah, i couldn't hear you internet is really bad the only solution is uh, my so gosh i can only hear myself that, yeah, <laughs> i don't know how to see the chat. yeah, yeah. Okay. Somebody has switched on the YouTube no. on the back background. Can you please mute Sorry, that? Sorry, what? Please? Sure. Yeah, oh. Really okay, okay. Arun, I think you have the YouTube on the background. Oh, that's why. Ah. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I had. Okay, okay. Sorry. I got oh, it. Then can you please mute it? Yeah, 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 I muted it. Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Is it better now, Kavita? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. That was uh, yeah. I'm just trying to. so if i present only the window this inclusive ecology then can i still shift between that and looking at the zoom chat like just all tab it like that's how i did it with the entire screen okay i'll, I'll just check i'm just checking that well i can because uh, because i'm not sharing the screen now ah uh, okay But I, I, okay. I can, I'm seeing a strip, Kavita, on YouTube. On yeah, Zoom. yeah. I'm going to stop it. I think I'll, I'll go. Yes. To do. Yes. Full screen. Yeah, that I think that cool. probably yeah. worked better. Yeah. What I was doing before. I think that's better. Yeah. Just because. You know, yeah. Just it because it's like. something. <laughs> it <was> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Then can I still shift between that? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, know. so I'll just do that the, and come back. I think the best is chat. Somebody has to read out. Otherwise, I just don't think there is an easy solution. Yeah, yeah. I'm the, okay. Okay, I'm just going to go out. Okay. Oh, okay. Doing what I was doing before. I think that's yeah. that's something. I think. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I will. Okay. okay. So that. I'll just do. I will quickly introduce. Okay. You see if it improves my this one. Okay. Yeah. That. I can hear you. Can yeah, yeah. Hello, Kavita. Yeah, Kanika, I, I can hear yeah. you. Yeah, Kavita, I was saying, should I just quickly share and see how I got to see the chats when I was presenting because I could hey, see. No, no, hey, no worries, no worries. Okay, okay. I think it's fine. I think I'll just manage like this, and later yeah. on I'll learn from you since this is going to be a big part of life. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I'll just yeah. Uh, leave no and re-enter yeah. just to see. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Kanika, I have sent you the link, YouTube link. Yeah. Thank you. Hey Arun. So in the YouTube, the problem is that that uh, chat, as in the questions that people type. For a very long time, it will show that something is wrong, and that monkey image will be there. Uh, is it like okay? <laughs> like why it happens? It happened for us also. Yeah, uh, like uh, I have no idea because it's like on the YouTube side, we, uh, like okay. we don't have a technical thing to look after that. Okay, okay, okay. Fine, okay. Then whenever it opens up, then it opens up. <laughs> uh, so Nitin, yeah. so whenever I refresh that screen. Yeah. That thing goes away. So I think the for very first time you can just try. No, no, I tried refreshing it like five, six times now. Oh, oh okay. Away. For me also the same thing. When I refresh, then it came. I have refreshed it like ten, twenty times now. I've been refreshing since I opened it. That's not helping. Anyway, we'll see. It appears automatically sometimes. That's all. Thank <laughs> you.
पवित्रा मधुर
Hello, Kavita, are you there? Can we start now? Hello? Yeah, sure. Ah. I'm here. Should we wait or is this... Uh... So 10.05, we have been starting. Okay, yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. We can start, we can wait for four more minutes, maybe. 10, 10, is it okay? Okay, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, hello everyone, this is uh, it's 10, 12, 10 11 now. Uh, so, my name is Vishwesha. So, I welcome you all uh, back to the last two days of this workshop. Uh, thank you again for showing interest and participating. So, today we have Professor Kavita Ishwaran who will introduce you to 
the importance of quantitative thinking in ecology and uh, we hope that you will again uh, you know be interactive as as many questions as possible and uh, learn through this workshop that's for the morning session in the afternoon we have two workshops focusing uh, uh, one on communication skills which is extremely important in any career you choose and uh, and equally so in academia and uh, the second part of the uh, afternoon today will be on uh, uh, careers in ecology what all students who do phd in ecology uh, do afterwards you know that's something uh, uh, many of us may not know and uh, a lot of us thinks that uh, phd necessarily means being a professor at the end of the day but as we will see today uh, that's actually a very very small minority okay so we will have uh, this uh, that's the plan for today and uh, tomorrow uh, you know will be a workshop on conservation in the morning by umesh shrinivasan and in the afternoon um, all of you who have signed up have been uh, given schedule for meeting faculties and after that we will have a student uh, open session with all the students and followed by concluding session okay so that's it from my side uh, over to kavita yeah thanks vishu Uh, hi, hi everyone. Um, welcome, like Vishu said, to the second week of this inclusive ecology workshop. Um, and uh, I was uh, watching during the sessions in the last week, and I must say it was uh, um, so nice to see such interaction, such participation. You know, when uh, uh, one conducts such sessions, that's one of the biggest rewards. So I hope that continues and that you'll continue to participate fully in uh, today and tomorrow's sessions uh, also. <clears throat> so as Vishu said, I'll be uh, doing this workshop on quantitative thinking, basically on study design and uh, basics of statistical inference, something that all of us, whether we ask questions in ecology and evolution and behavior and conservation science and any of these fields, it's a common a common um, uh, element of our research in there. Uh, so here are the different ways you can uh, ask questions. So first of all, stop me at any point. There's no problem. Um, you know, I want to thank Nitin. Nitin Saxena is helping today with this session. So if you raise your hand or type a question in the chat box and so on, Nitin will stop me because I, I, I won't be able to see it when I'm presenting my screen, but Nitin will stop me and we can stop at any time, go into details, go into discussions. It's most welcome. I'll also stop every 15 or 20 minutes to find out if there are any uh, questions um, and also to take breaks because I think, you know, at least uh, my attention span 15, 20 minutes is all I can do before I need that quick minute to kind of rest and then uh, continue. So that's about uh, asking questions. Um, I'll also, you know, because a lot of these uh, ideas in study design and statistics, um, you know, requires that you um, grasp the concepts nicely. Uh, I'm also going to keep posing questions to you and just type out the answer in the chat box. Don't worry about whether it's abrupt language, etc. It's just to get a feel for what you're thinking. And don't worry, is this the correct answer? Is this a wrong answer? You'll see that there is rarely any clear, correct or wrong answer. And so much depends on the situation. So the important thing is to just train yourself to keep thinking and problem solving. A lot of it is problem solving. Uh, one last thing I just uh, wanted to mention, which is about actually this afternoon's workshop, the careers in ecology workshop that uh, Vishu had mentioned. Um, you know, Tanveen and Seshadri are running it and I'm uh, helping them. Oh, and uh, and one of the, um, uh, you know, it, it, uh, Tanmin and Seshadri have a very diverse set of uh, uh, resource persons taking part in this workshop. Uh, so what would also really help them is if you uh, send in any questions that you have. I think they've already told you who's going to be there. If you have any particular questions about how one gets started in a career like that or how one does prep for a career like that, uh, please just jot that down in the form that Tanmin and Seshatri circulated. 
Uh, because I think that will really uh, help them also make sure that uh, the most comes out of that careers uh, in ecology workshop, the most for you. OK, so that was a diversion back to the workshop on quantitative thinking. I'm just going to just give me a couple of seconds. I'm just going to quickly share my screen. If at any point my, you know, my uh, you're not I'm not audible or there's a problem with the video or there's a problem with um, looking at my screen again, uh, just uh, drop something down in the chat box and Nitin will let me know. Okay, hopefully you can see my screen now. Nitin, can you just confirm? Yes, yes, we can yeah, see. Perfect, perfect. Thanks, Nitin. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, why are we here typically thinking about quantitative thinking? You know, as ecologists, evolutionary biologists, uh, behavioral ecologists, or conservation scientists, there is a question that excites us there's a question that we really want to study and answer so as a behavioral ecologist i might be interested in how female black buck those uh, brown creatures there without horns how female uh, black buck choose between males as someone interested in studying species interactions um, what you can see here is a kind of predator prey interaction uh, there's a snake predating on the nest of uh, bulbuls, I think. So you might be interested in asking what kinds of traits do prey evolve to avoid predation? What kinds of traits do predators then evolve to try and counteract prey defenses? Or as uh, at the population level, how do prey and predator populations influence each other and so on? Or you might be interested in larger scale questions. You know, why are there so many species of trees in this forest here, but far fewer here. Um, are these, what kinds of interactions um, structure these tree communities? Or maybe you're interested in more applied questions. Um, you know, what you see here is a lantana plant. And as many of you know, lantana is an invasive uh, plant that can take over whole forests. So you might be interested in how does an invasive plant like lantana, which flowers abundantly, fruits abundantly, and can kind of change the resource landscape in a forest, how does that affect butterfly behavior, butterfly ecology, uh, an applied question like that? Or maybe what motivates you is human wildlife conflict. What you can see here are black buck feeding on crops. So you might want to understand what predicts which crop fields are most likely to be visited and uh, used by black buck? Can we then design mitigation measures towards those crop fields? So we have all these questions that uh, you know we are interested in and we want to carry out research and come up with answers that we are happy with. And two important um, elements of answering these questions. First of all, study design. To answer questions effectively, there are some basic principles of study design that can really help. Um, and what I want to try and do today is give you a flavor of the some of the key elements. So this is not going to be comprehensive because it's a relatively short workshop. So it's not going to be comprehensive and we can't touch on all the points, but to give you a feel for the kinds of, um, uh, you know, points you should keep in mind when you're designing your study and what kind of challenges might you encounter. Um, that's that's my aim today to give you a feel for that. The second um, key element towards answering questions is statistical inference. That is, how do we come to uh, solid conclusions from our data. How do we use statistical methods to come to conclusions we are comfortable with in our data? So as you can see, the boxes are kind of unequal and that's because I'll be spending more time on study design and a bit less time on statistical inference. And in statistical inference, I'm going to fo focus on larger key points like why do we use these methods? What are some common key quantities we um, estimate? 
and how do we decide what kind of a test we want rather than going through comprehensively you know t test chi square this you know a whole list of methods that's not the aim of this workshop okay so let's start um with study design i think before we go into study design it's very important to reiterate uh, that the goals of study design should be very clear in our mind so what what are these main goals first of all we want to be able to generalize what do i mean by that say um, here are uh, barking deer and you know imagine that i have a simple question i am interested in whether male barking deer are larger than females so what do i do i go into this forest uh, say maybe a forest in the western ghats and i catch i capture 20 males and 20 females and i measure them so at the end of my study i'm not interested in saying these 20 males were so many you know were uh, you know their height at shoulder level was so much or their mass was so many kilograms and these 20 females weighed so much that's not my goal what i want to be able to do is to generalize from the sample to the barking deer population in that area so the sample is only interesting from the point of view of what it allows us to generalize about the population there's a second level of generalization that we often don't talk about but um, is always there is the larger universe you would like to generalize to so typically you know i don't want to just say barking deer in um, you know in mudumalai this is the pattern i'm hoping that my result will be relevant to maybe barking deer populations in general or at least in uh, you know dry to moist deciduous forests or maybe i'd like to say something about the differences in male and female body sizes in ungulates or maybe in kind of medium to largeish herbivores meaning animals with a similar ecology so it's important to also think of this larger universe you'd like to generalize to because um the way you'd make sure you can achieve that generalization is by being clever about which population you set out to study so hopefully you know you don't pick a barking deer population that's uh, you know uh, peculiar in some uh, way like maybe it's in an enclosure or fenced in or something like that or given a lot of extra food but you would like it to represent barking deer populations in general so today what we'll be doing is focusing on the first level of generalization which is from sample how do we design our study carry out statistics to be able to generalize from sample to population okay so that's one goal of uh, study design now if you start design your study effectively a second very important goal is reliability so what do we mean by reliability what we mean is if i were to go back to this barking deer population two years from now and if ecological conditions are largely the same i should get a similar result so suppose say when i first did my study i found that males are 10% larger than females now if uh, the ecological conditions have stayed largely the same if i go back i should get something close to that or i should at least get the result that males are somewhat larger than females if i go back and then get this result that now females are larger than males or now males are like 80% larger than females then there's something uh, you know there's something problematic about the way i've designed my study this is of course assuming that conditions have not changed now a third goal that i'd like to quickly talk to you about um is causal inference what we mean is uh, from this is making cause and effect statements so males are larger than females because males engage in male male competition where body size is important females do not so that would be a causal statement now very often in observational studies all of you must have heard the statement correlation is not causation and that's extremely important to remember because only ideally in a well designed experiment can you get that cause to some degree even there it's difficult now in observational studies um with so many other factors at play including things that we've not even thought about or measured 
it's uh, quite difficult to make strong cause and effect statements, but it is possible. It is possible if you pay attention to study design and statistical inference. So hopefully through this workshop, some ideas of how to strengthen, how do you design your study so that you can strengthen causal inference. Hopefully that will also come through. OK, so an important preliminary before you jump into study design is the question must be absolutely clear in your mind, because if your question is not clear, you are going to be fuzzy about what you will measure and how you will measure it. And you might end up in that situation where at the end of the study, you find that what you measured actually doesn't help you answer your specific question. So it's very important that your question is clearly laid out so that you know what you need to measure. And at the end, you can relate back. Uh, you know, this result tells me this about my question. OK, so let's start with one of the key elements of study design, which is how should you choose sampling units, meaning the units that you are going to now uh, observe or measure in some way. And the question, first of all, is why are we even talking of multiple units? You know, why are we talking about replicates or replication? Why is replication important? So let's start with an example. So uh, many of you may have seen these. These are different. Uh, these are weaver bird nests. So as you know, these Baya weavers, they uh, uh, often nest in colonies and these colonies can really get large in numbers. You know, you can get 50, 60 nests. You also have occasional solitary nests. Now I wanted to look at the nests and you'll see that they're all at different stages of completion. You know, the first stage, um, the top right one uh, male is actually working on the nest. It's called a helmet stage because it's just the top like that with one chin strap. And then, of course, you have completed nests with, you know, the long entrance tube and so on. Now, it's actually quite costly for males to be nesting together because, you know, males steal material from each other. They destroy each other's nests and then females are not attracted to messy looking nests, destroyed nests and so on. So the question is, why? Why should males nest in a colony? OK, so now my question to you is to answer this question of why they are nesting in a colony. Is it sufficient? What I'd like you to tell me is, do you think it's sufficient if I study one colony in a lot of detail in this large weaver bird uh, population? To understand what happens within a colony, do you feel it's sufficient if I study one colony alone? And if not, can you quickly jot down in the chat box why? Why do we need replicates of things? Just jot down, just take half a minute, think about why do we need replicates? If I need to understand what happens in a colony, can I just pick one weaver bird colony, study it really well, and is that enough? Yeah, take, yeah, that's, uh, that's a point. So there's one comment here that we might need to compare different colonies. I'll just wait for uh, 10, 15 seconds for people to jot down and then we'll just discuss. Yeah, all of you are putting down very interesting points. OK, yeah, I think you're all touching on um, some key points here. And that is. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Just uh, Nitin, let me know if you can't. So I yes. think all of yeah, all of you are touching on a very key point here, which is that there is variation. 
typically in our the systems we study now if every bird behaved very very similarly and every colony showed very very similar behavior dynamics then actually studying one bird or one colony or one nest would be sufficient for us to generalize about that weaver bird population but the problem is i think as uh, all of you have pointed out is that you can have a lot of variation between colonies so then if we study only one replicate what we get the answer that we get is biased towards a subset of the population so we rep uh, we replicate to increase reliability which means when we go back we get a similar answer to quantify this variability which can be very interesting in it itself and to be able to generalize to be able to represent the population well and therefore be able to generalize well to the population but now i want you to think about these replicates these replicates have to be independent what that means is that each data point should provide its own independent piece of information for us to be able to come to conclusions but what is an independent unit and that depends on the question so again let's go back to this weaver bird colony and let me now give you a specific idea i'm going to test so like i told you being in this colony has costs for males they fight with each other they steal each other's material they make each other's nests look horrible and so on so why should they nest together in a colony why not have nests scattered about one hypothesis is that it's because the uh, chick survival offspring survival is higher when nests are uh clustered together like this in a colony because they provide uh, benefits against predation so you have these um, small mice that um, you know destroy nests and eggs and chicks you have uh, snakes coming in and feeding on uh, eggs and chicks and so on and the idea is that when you are in, when the nests are in a group because of dilution effects or because um, you know males can uh you know try to attack predators or you know because of processes like that the probability of offspring of chick surviving is higher in a large colony than if nests are alone or in a small colony so that's the hypothesis that viva birds they cluster their nests to reduce predation on their offspring so now i'm interested in studying through test this hypothesis this is what i do this going to okay so this is what i do i take um you know here i have a colony that's oops oh, sorry sorry that's got two nests and what i do is each nest from when the eggs are laid to when either the eggs or offspring disappear which means they have been uh, uh, taken away by predators or they uh, fled successfully i monitor the nests so i monitor in a colony of two nests i monitor both nests and then there is another colony which has three nests i monitor all three nests and then there's another colony with 10 nests i monitor all 10 nests and then there's another colony with 50 nests and i monitor all 50 nests so again each nest i measure how many offspring successfully fledge is it 0 is it 1 is it 2 is it 3 okay so now what i wanted to quickly put down in the chat box is how many independent replicates do i have for my question my question is now the idea i am testing is in larger colonies the probability of a chick being eaten or predation risk faced by chicks is lower that's the hypothesis and i am monitoring all these nests in four different colonies so 65 nests in four different colonies i am monitoring them 
what's my sample size? How many independent replicates do I have? So take 10 seconds and then quickly jot down what you think are the number of independent replicates I have in my study to answer my question. So I think all of you are getting there, even though the unit that I am monitoring, even though the unit I'm monitoring is a nest, my question is at a different scale. My question is at the scale of the colony, right? Because if you look in this graph here, what this graph is showing you is you know, uh, colonies of oops, uh, different colonies of different sizes. And what this graph is showing you is how many fledglings, um, you know, how many chicks fledge from colonies of different sizes, colonies with uh, eight nests, uh, 10 nests and so on, all the way up to 55 nests. So what I'm comparing here is a pattern across colonies so which means even if i measure 50 nests within the same colony those 50 nests are subsamples that give me a very nice very confident estimate of how much predation chicks face in a colony of that size so 50 nests there are 50 subsamples that go towards giving me a very nice estimate very confident estimate of one independent unit. So if the scale of the question is at the level of the colony, colonies are the independent sampling units. And in the previous case, what I showed you, I actually had only four, sam my sample size was only four. Whereas what I would have ideally had to do is make sure I get a larger sample size, like the pattern that I show here. If my question is different, you know, let's go back to this review about colony. If my question is different, if I'm asking, how does, you know, all these nests are there, all these nests are clustered together. If I'm asking, how does predation risk change from the center of the colony towards the periphery? Um, you know, is there pressure on individuals to try to build their nests in the periphery or in the center or some particular location in the colony or does it matter? Does it not matter at all? Then what I'm asking is a within colony question where I'm interested in what happens to chicks in nests at different distances from the center to the periphery. So what I'm interested is in a graph like this. I'm interested in looking at how as you go from the center to the periphery of the colony, how does you know, the chick survival, how does it change? The number of fledglings that come out of a nest successfully, how does that change? And here the answer seems to be uh, that it's uh, lower towards the periphery. So here, in fact, individual nests could be independent uh, data points. I might want to repeat this on a few different colonies because as you pointed out, you could have colony specific uh, something going on so you know in one colony which is over water predators may not be able to access it so well compared to a colony which is you know that uh, in that case the tree might be the branches might be overhanging water or you might have uh, the tree being in the middle of a grassland so there the predator density predation risk might be different so i might want to repeat this on a few colonies but colony is not my independent data point here it's the nest at different distances from the center of the colony. So I hope that was clear that what we call the same nest in one case is not an independent sampling unit, but it is in another case. So what an independent sampling unit 
depends on your question it's not that discrete thing that you are measuring or you know it's not the unit that you are doesn't have to be necessarily the unit on which you are making your observations or measurements so i hope that's clear so at this point before i continue i just want to quickly check with people if there are any questions i'll just wait for 10 15 seconds and if not we'll move on yeah if you have any questions put it down otherwise we'll keep moving on and then you can always jot down your questions at any point in the chat box okay so let's move on then yeah uh, kavita yeah uh, i just have one doubt uh, i think hmm. uh, purnima also wrote zero because of that so hmm. initially you ask uh, that uh, given that we want to understand uh, if the size of the uh, colony as in the number of nest in the colony help it uh, do better uh, predation escape right Uh, yeah so if that is the question then uh, me saying that i started with 2 3 10 and 50 doesn't that become one cluster of my sampling and then i need to repeat it with another sets to call it replicates or does that single uh, like the fact that it is 50 and the 3 they become my replicates because if the size is a variation because then hmm. i need to cover a range of a variation as a single uh sampling unit isn't it yes in the sense that 2 3 uh, i think i had 2 3 10 and 50 or something that's not sufficient so i should have many more along that range but 2 um, is not necessary you know uh, i don't uh, so there are a couple of different points here if i want to say what happens at exactly 2 i might have to repeat 2 many times but if what i want is to say as the number of nests in a colony increases how does predation risk change then i just need to make sure that along this range of colony sizes in this uh, weaver bird population i need to know roughly what that range is that i sample well all along that range does that make sense yeah 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 so basically then my replicates is each individual colony because each individual colony is contributing towards my understanding of uh yes. predation risk right yes but four is definitely not enough yes. to yeah, say yeah. and because especially at the large size i only have one right at yeah, yeah. you know anything larger than 25 or 30 i only have one so yeah absolutely thanks yeah okay so let's continue for a few more minutes on this theme of what makes replicates non independent and i want to cover some common processes that result in uh, replicates uh, kind of showing correlated behavior what that means again just to emphasize because you know you might be wondering what does this non independent correlated what does it mean all it means is that we want each data point to represent its own independent contribution towards us answering our question so if two colonies if you measure say two colonies and two colonies give you exactly the same answer if one goes if the answer predation risk is high here this one also goes high if the predation risk is lower here this one also goes lower then the two are not really representing two independent piece of information they are correlated correlated in the sense that the thing you are measuring from one is very similar to the thing you are measuring from the other one so they are not giving you two separate independent pieces of information so here again uh, i am going to pose a, a problem to you and ask you um, uh, which is going to help us figure out what can what are some common factors that make replicates non independent so what you are seeing in front of you is a large uh, grassland grassland in uh, western india in gujarat and then we have these grazers um primarily this medium sized antelope the black buck and uh, imagine that i am interested in studying grass species richness meaning the number of species of grasses that you find in an area 
and uh, there's a very popular hypothesis that grazing by herbivores can actually promote grass species richness meaning because of the action of grazers no individual grass species becomes dominant in an area and so many more species are able to coexist in an area whereas if you exclude grazer, grazers now the competitive the, the uh, grass species that are better at competition will outcompete the others and so the number of grass species will go up suppose i am interested in this question that grazing by black buck can actually maintain higher numbers of grass species than if there is no grazing by black buck i hope that question is clear so what do i do to answer this question i am going to put these exclosures that is i'm going to fence off areas in this grassland so now in this fenced area black buck can't go in so there's no grazing by uh, large herb herbivores um and then i'm going to have open areas in the grassland for comparison where black buck can freely move and feed on these grasses then after uh, you know a couple of months i'm going to measure the number of um grass species in these um, two kinds two treatments these exclosures where grazers are excluded and and the grazers happily move through and this is how i lay these plots so i have one here oops so this is my exclosure just imagine that it's an exclosure there i've put a nice fence and uh, black buck can't get in there then i have another exclosure here so sensitive my mouse pad really sorry about it and say you know these fences are very difficult to um, put down and maintain and so on so imagine i have five i've shown you three they say three i do these three fences here and then on uh, this side here i have three open areas for comparison so remember in these open areas it's the same dimension as the exclosures just that there are no it's not fenced off so remember here that black buck can move freely so afterwards when i measure what i find is something completely uh counter to what i uh, imagined would happen so i have 20 grass species here 20 here 20 here and i have 10 grass species here okay so i hope the setup is clear to everyone i have three fenced areas these are my fenced areas here i have three fenced areas and in those fenced areas i measure 10 species of grasses and then i have these three free areas free to grazers areas and there i measure 20 grass species so what are my conclusions from this of course one possible conclusion is that in fact grazers depress grass species richness through some mechanism maybe they stress out grasses or um oh sorry 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 i'm so sorry it's the it's the way that i predicted uh, i wanted to give you the other example but i didn't but that's no problem sorry so in the unfenced areas i have more grass species 20 and in the fenced areas i have fewer grass species 10 yes so one possible conclusion from this is what i had predicted right i had predicted that where there are grazers there should be more grass species um that's one possible interpretation now what i want you to think of take 10 seconds to think about is is there a problem with my design is there an alternative explanation a different explanation that you can come with just by looking at my design that's my question
And again, just jot it down in the chat box. Don't worry about whether it looks abrupt or language or anything. This is just for you to kind of share how you're thinking about it. So again, to repeat my question, one interpretation is that yes, my hypothesis is supported. Grazers do allow more grass species to coexist. But what is another possible interpretation based on the design I've showed you? Uh, Kavita, uh, huh? there is a question from the previous segment where you were talking about the nest. Uh, hmm. Koina, Koina uh, asked that the four type of nest were, were they in sympatric habitat or not? Yes, they were all in the same population. Absolutely. Yeah, that would be important that they uh, that I'm not measuring large colonies in a different area and small colonies in a different area, then they wouldn't be comparable. Absolutely. So there, to keep things simple, they were all in the same habitat. Now, same population, same habitat. Okay, let me quickly go and see what. Um, so can you think? Oh, this is it. Yeah, can you jot down? Um, do you have any other explanation for the result that I uh, showed you there. OK, yeah, so we have um, a suggestion here that the enclosures are concentrated on one side while the unfenced ones on the other. So absolutely, another explanation for this difference between these exclosures, grass species richness and exclosures and grass species richness in these unfenced areas could just be that there's some gradient in the grassland that I don't know about. So for example, maybe there's a slight slope um, that results in differences in soil moisture. Or maybe there are, um, you know, there's some differences in soil nutrients in this grassland. As a result of which parts of the grassland, um, uh, you know, are more productive and can maybe, uh, you know, support more species than other parts of the grassland. So such correlations in space, spatial correlations are a common reason. Um, that results in data points being not independent correlations in space. The way out here in this, in my example here, the way out would be to make sure that um, the exclosures and the control plots are, the term is called interspersed, meaning that they, uh, you know, in this grassland, you don't have any concentration of one particular treatment, but you have both treatments scattered across this grassland. Okay, another very common correlation that you see in data, back to our weaver birds. So remember what I wanted to do is look at how predation changes with colony size, right? So what do I do? You know, as many of you know, these birds uh, breed in the monsoon. So what I do is I measure predation. Uh, you know, I look at predator attacks in these small colonies from the 2nd to the 30th of June. And I measure um, predators and predation risk in the large colony from 10 July to 10 August. And I find that in fact, um, uh, as I pred uh, predicted, predation risk is higher in these small colonies and lower in these large colonies. So again, one possible explanation is that uh, large colonies, one possible explanation is in fact that large colonies um, reduce predation risk on offspring. But look at what I've done. I've gone and done all the colonies earlier in the monsoon and then done all the larger colonies later in the monsoon. So 
another interpretation you could criticize this design and say no no you don't believe me maybe predators are more uh, the way predators behavior or predator densities might be higher early in june and then in july and august predator densities may be lower so it's not at all a colony um, effect but la uh, you know more a time effect so such correlations in time can also affect our work and again the way out is interspersion do a few colonies and you know do a mixture of small and large colonies in june mixture of small and large colonies in july and august so there's no temporal correlation now for a question like weaver birds that's easier than that. i mean that you can you can do that it's possible but imagine what if you are doing a breeding bird survey in the monsoon all along the western ghats and you want to see whether the number of species of breeding birds or breeding bird abundance varies with latitude so you want to go in the western ghats all the way from goa to kerala right so now what do i do because i have only this one jeep and you know i have to finish everything in two months basically i start in goa and quickly you know every 100 kilometers i do breeding bird surveys all the way down to kerala and i manage to finish it somehow by rushing about manage to finish it by the end of the month so again the problem here is if i find a difference in breeding bird abundance is it because of latitude or is it just because earlier or later in the monsoon conditions are better for birds and so they breed the abundance is higher time is again a big problem in that design but imagine what is my solution you know ideally i should go to all locations along the western ghats at the same time but what if i have only one vehicle and one team that can be difficult if i am able to say have multiple teams that would be great at least we can go to different parts different latitudes at approximately the same time so this time correlation would be taken care of or if i had a bit more time what i could do is try to do a few more northern populations then go and do a few more southern population then go back to the north try some amount of interspersion i think the point i want to mention here is interspersion conceptually you know all of you will agree with me and say that of course you know you can't just start and go on and drive down to kerala then you know you don't know whether it's the monsoon or whether it's latitude which is uh, progression of monsoon or latitude which is affecting your breeding bird abundance uh, but to actually mix it up nicely to intersperse my sampling in all these different latitudes logistically i might be constrained it's still important to keep this in mind so that when you're interpreting your result you can you know you can consider how much of a problem is this time correlation part okay so as i just said interspersion is important um quickly to mention there are other possible correlations so suppose what i am doing is measuring how the abundance of food affects how fast uh, chicks uh, grow um and you know i uh, follow um say three different nests so those are the three different nests in three different colors and in each nest i measure four different uh chicks again i have to think of whether my sample size is 3 for three nests or whether it's 4 uh, times 3 12 for 12 chicks the problem is chicks within the same nest might share genetic environments because uh, they share parents they might share parental environments you know parent feeding rates and so on and because of that chicks within the same nest may not represent independent pieces of information again this doesn't mean i want to do only one chick per nest i might want to do multiple chicks to get like you know multiple sub samples to get a good idea of the sample but i have to keep in mind that multiple chicks in a nest may not represent independent samples okay so i'm going to uh, discuss with you one last question and then uh, we are going to take a couple of minutes break yeah uh, sorry, sorry. sorry uh before you go to the next question question uh, there is couple hmm. of points that people mentioned on the blackbird question that you asked uh, ha, ha. so asta says that as blackbird cannot enter the enclosure 
so they are not able to pol pollinate the species of grasses via their feces ah. leading to less species and anand okay. is asking is hmm. it possible for the grass species to be independent where it isn't affected by the black bug like whether it gets grazed or not um so for the first question uh, i think what you're doing is proposing mechanisms by which you know to try to explain why within the exclosure there are fewer grass species and absolutely so you know it doesn't even have to be the uh, action of you know the the action of uh, food being uh, eaten it could have something to do with uh, the um, you know fertilization effect with black buck dung and so on absolutely so even if i find this result i can't conclude that it's because of competition i mean that it's because of black buck reducing competition it could be because of black buck generating better conditions for growth uh, about the second uh, point um i think i didn't fully understand it uh, i'm wondering whether you mean is it possible that grass species um could have independent effects so absolutely in the sense like i was telling you because we've not moved around the exclosures and the control plots it's possible that what we are seeing is um species responding independently to local conditions and because the open plots were in one particular area they could be responding independently to you know whatever the conditions are there in that area and not really responding to the herbivore uh, action i hope i uh, address that if not you can just put in a clarifying question and i can try to address it better any other questions nitin uh, sorry nothing more that's all thanks oh yeah thank you okay so one last um, uh, setup that i'm going to discuss with you to again to just round off our discussion about um, what is a independent data point and uh, then we'll have a break okay so um imagine that i'm studying whether logging so logging is uh, where uh, trees are cut down um whether the removal of trees whether that dec uh, decreases recruitment in a bird species so recruitment is where offspring from one generation um uh, kind of contribute towards the breeding population they are recruited into the breeding population this gives us an idea about the health of the uh, population um so suppose i am interested in the effect of logging on a particular bird species i worry that logging is affecting the population of this bird species so what i do is i pick up um logged forest uh f1 and uh, choose 60 nests to uh, follow and then see how many juvenile birds uh, come from these 60 nests so that uh, that's my estimate of recruitment and then i choose an unlogged forest a large area similarly large area say my logged forest is 50 square kilometers and my unlogged forest is 50 square kilometers there i choose 50 nests and again follow and what i find the means that you can see that is the mean number of juvenile birds that each of these nests produce and as you can see in f1 the mean is 0.8 f2 mean is 2.2 so in this unlocked forest in fact the mean is greater and it is um, uh, consistently greater because the 95 confidence and 95% confidence interval which is given in brackets also shows so in f2 the unlocked forest the 95% confidence interval says that uh, 1.7 to 3 birds uh, juveniles are produced per nest and it's much smaller not at all overlapping in the log forest f1 0.2 to 1.3 so this seems to be quite a nice solid case for me to conclude is recruitment in log forest less than recruitment in unlock forest so all i want you to do is just look at the statement for 10 seconds and just write yes or no 
do you agree with this based on these results that i have presented to you i have this logged f1 and this unlogged f2 and mean in f1 is clearly smaller point it you know i've done say i've done a t test also and i find it's highly significant and in f2 the unlogged forest mean is much larger will you agree with my statement my conclusion i conclude based on this recruitment is law in logged is less than recruitment in unlogged take 10 seconds just write yes or no and don't worry is it the correct answer is it the wrong answer the whole point is to discuss this i'll wait for a few more responses just put down yes no or don't understand that's also fine then i can just explain it better okay so let's get back to the question i think you've had time to think about it whether you've put it in the chat box or not um i think there was a point there about sample sizes not being the same that may or may not be a problem uh, remember that sample sizes don't necessarily have to be equal we need to and we'll come back to this the sample size is important um you know regarding the point that we have to be able to um estimate we have to be able to the thing that we are measuring we should be able to estimate that well so that means if there is a lot of variation you need a larger sample size if there's less variation you need a, a smaller sample size so uh, you know you have to have sample sizes when you're making comparisons that are roughly similar but they don't have to be exactly the same okay coming back to our question is recruitment in log less than can can i conclude based on the based on these data that recruitment in log is less than recruitment in unlog actually i cannot for the reason that yes i can conclude recruitment in f1 is less than f2 but remember my question is actually at the scale of forests right because i'm asking our bird populations in logged forests do they show lower recruitment than bird populations in unlogged forest so but what have i done i've chosen one logged forest f1 and one unlogged forest f2 so what i can conclude statistically is that recruitment in f1 is less than recruitment in f2 however for the biological inference which is i am not interested in saying f1 is different from f2 i want to say something about logging that argument has to be based on features of f1 and f2 not on statistics because statistically i can say f1 is different from f2 now to say this is because of logging i have to say you know everything else is roughly similar between these two forests the only thing that's really different is logging and so on so this is a case of pseudo replication in the sense that actually i have only one sample for each of the conditions i'm uh, interested in and if i really wanted to match replication i'd have to think of forest patch as a replicate and have multiple log than multiple unlogged forest but of course that's not possible right just even studying two forests is a huge effort so does this mean that we never study large scale questions of course not large scale questions are important only the way we design them we have to take a bit more care so if i cannot replicate so if i cannot do multiple log forests and multiple unlog forest patches then i should measure initial conditions i should show that these forests are roughly the same they are in the same rough habitat they are the same rough forest types and so on if i can measure multiple of at least one situation so maybe you know unlogged forests are not very common say you know there's some level of logging in most forest patches then even if i compare three logged patches to one unlogged i can come to a better stronger conclusion rather than you know when you measure two things one is going to be higher than the other just by chance right 
also throughout i have to be very careful to say my statistical comparison is at this level my biological comparison is at this other level so i have to be very clear about where statistical inference or statistical conclusions uh, statements i'm making and where i'm coming to biological conclusions i should also it will really help if i can show that my sample is a good representative of the population what does that mean i should show that this logged forest is a good representative of yeah. logged forests in general this unlogged patch is you know represents unlogged patches really well so when i compare them i can be confident that the result i'm seeing is tied to logging what would really help is if i had a stronger hypothesis if i could have multiple lines of evidence rather than just saying you know juvenile bird numbers are higher here lower here which can happen for so many different reasons if i have a good idea about why logging is uh, you know affecting um, uh, recruitment so for example maybe logging is now creating conditions that results in higher densities of predators of these uh, young ones of these offspring now i can test um how predator density changes between the two logged and unlogged forests f1 and f2 and then how does uh, predation in the nests change between f1 and f2 um and therefore how does so if i have multiple links in the hypothesis and all those links are supported that happening just by chance with nothing to do with logging is much more difficult so multiple lines of evidence will really help finally you can also search the literature you can think of your study as one sample search the literature for other such studies and do what is called a meta analysis that's where you take results from multiple areas multiple studies and ask given you know do we commonly find this result uh, consistently find this result across different studies that would be another way to support the result that you come up with okay so i'm going to stop here just for um, it's now 11:13 according to my um, uh, the time here let's just have a quick break till 11:20 because sometimes it is difficult to go on and on and on and you know attention spans can waver and at 11:20 uh, we'll get back uh, kavita there is just one question Yes, uh, yes, yes. Yogesh asks, does the time series data of F1 and F2 act as good replicates for a suitable time period? Um, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, but for example, if you're saying, say, here we have two forest patches that you know before logging started, and you can show that they are very similar, and then logging starts in one of them, and you know you then look at how. in this kind of uh, control versus logged patch if you then follow um, say juvenile bird densities and you show that initially they are the same one is decreasing one is staying the same that would again be very strong i mean stronger evidence than just one snapshot absolutely so these thing this this kind of a setup is of also often called like a before after control impact kind of experimental design mom my question was something similar to like uh, what is uh, we have f1 and f2 and we keep uh, looking at the population uh, at like a particular let's say a particular month uh, for like 5 years and then hmm. uh, we sort of have like a yearly data so f1 in 2020 and f1 hmm. f2 in 2020 and we have like a yearly data set so hmm. does these time series of uh, a particular period like one year act as replicates hmm. of uh, to understand that you know what is just not this particular year that we have we are having a significant uh, difference in the means but then so yeah no absolutely i understand your question now thank you for clarifying um i think it uh, works to uh, take care of the uh, snapshot problem meaning like you said you know what if this was peculiar of this year and the next year you have a different result absolutely but it doesn't get around the problem see when you have two forest patches no 
they're not going to have exactly the same conditions right so you know maybe it's not logging maybe it has to do with the grazing that's there in one and no grazing in the other or maybe there is hunting of some form or you know so many potential things could be different between two forest patches so that we won't get around you know unless we do something a little more does that answer your question oh yes ma'am
Hi everyone. Okay, we are back now. Yeah. So let's let's continue with the, we are continuing with the study design part. So like I said, we'll be spending about two thirds of the time on study design and then talk about how uh, statistics can help us <clears throat> uh, in our uh, kind of quest for answering questions. Okay. So hopefully you can see my screen. Um, I wanted to quickly touch on a question that many of us have, which is, you know, when I'm designing my study, how do I decide what my sample size should be? And you would have seen, you know, lots of kind of answers in the uh, literature. So there's sometimes this magic number 30 that keeps popping up or somebody, you know, somewhere you'd read, you know, do 5% of your population. Uh, there's actually no magic answer. It depends on a couple of key things. First of all, it depends on the variability in your system. So you can imagine if there's a lot of variation, you need larger sample size. If there's less variation, you need a smaller sample size. As that I think is something we think about very fast. But the other thing we don't think about so much is the magnitude of the effect you want to detect. Meaning, so what I've shown you is, you know, those patches are all unlocked patches. And imagine that, you know, those uh, dark brown dots are your plots. So you're comparing um, how many chicks fledge or whatever if in uh, unlocked and logged patches. Now, if the difference between logged and unlocked patches is very small, it's just 2%. Because of the variability when you're measuring it, you'll need a much larger sample size to detect a different of 2% compared to a different of 20%. To detect a different of 20%, you need much less, uh, you know, many fewer samples than for a smaller effect. So how large an effect you want to detect will also determine what your sample size should be. And remember this, you should decide before you start your study or, you know, fairly early on in your study. You can't carry out your study, do your data analysis and then go back. There are problems with that. OK. What is biologically meaningful? So the way you decide the magnitude of the effect you want to detect is you have to ask yourself, what effect is biologically meaningful? How do I figure this out? So, you know, I was talking to you about birds and about offspring recruiting into the breeding population of birds and so on. So given that predation is or mortality is pretty high in birds in that uh, first in those first few months when they are uh, juveniles. An addition of 2% because of logging may not really impact bird pop the bird population, but 20% definitely will. Whereas for some other trait, 2% can be pretty important, like a 2% fitness effect from displaying or something can be quite important and can lead to, uh, you know, the trait changing over time. So what this means is that you need to understand your system fairly well because it's your understanding, say, of the natural history of your system or similar systems that will let you figure out how large a difference do I want to detect? Because remember in nature, two things are not exactly the same. So whether you are concluding that they're the same or they are different completely depends on your sample size. Um, if you have huge sample size, 10,000, uh, 100,000 and so on, you'll detect even tiny trivial differences. So in a way you need to understand what, uh, you know, what kind of a difference is biologically meaningful in your system. One last point um, is that uh, you can try to figure this out through what are called power analyses, um, which are kind of simulations that you can do to say, you know, if there is so much variability and if this is the magnitude of the difference or the, you know, slope that I want to detect, how many samples do I need? So it's a kind of like, you know, in a way, it's also you thinking through what uh, sample size is um, uh, you should be aiming for. Uh, finally, I just want to remind you that if you are looking at lots of different effects, meaning if you're saying, OK, how is offspring survival, you know, juvenile bird survival, how is it affected by logging? How is it affected by weather? How is it affected by 
food availability, predator density, invasive plant species. So if you keep adding all the effects you want to be able to study, then your sample size has to increase. You can't use the same, say, 10 uh, samples and answer all these questions. So if you want to uh, look at multiple differences, multiple relationships, it means you have to incorporate more sampling units. Okay, so that's about sample size. And here's an exercise to take us into a different set of questions a slightly different set of questions so what you're seeing here like i told you before is this um lantana uh, invasive plant and these butterflies on these on this lantana so um many of you may know that lantana can completely change the resource landscape for um, many insects especially nectaring insects insects so Imagine that I'm studying lantana, the effects of lantana in a forest, and I'm very curious about why lantana is flowering so abundantly, because it's also, you know, costly for plants to produce uh, flowers. And um, I have this first, first step simple idea I want to test. I want to find out whether this strategy of lantana to flower so abundantly is to uh, bring pollinators to it is to increase the number of insect visitors. So I want to design a study to test this idea. Does the abundance of lantana flowers in the neighborhood, does this increase visits by insects? And this is what I'm going to do is show you two alternative observational study design, meaning where I don't do any manipulations, no experiments, and then ask you what the um, advantages and disadvantages of that are, and then go on to an experiment. So here is the first one you should look at. If you look at 1A, so remember my question is, does, you know, the, does the number of insects visiting lantana flowers, does that increase with how many flowers are around? So this is per, per flower visits, okay? So what do I do? I choose bushes, uh, bushes with five flowers, lantana plants with 10, 5, 10, 20, 40, 80, 100, 200, all the way to 1,600. So I have 10 different lantana plants. And on each of these plants, there are different numbers of flowers. This is natural variation. So there is one lantana which has only five flowers all the way to a lantana plant that has 1,600 flowers these inflorescences. You can see the inflorescences in the photo below. And in each, each of these plants, whether it's five inflorescences all the way to 1,600 inflorescences, each of these plants, I pick two inflorescences and watch them for half an hour. So I get per flower how many insects visit, per inflorescence, I should say, actually, per inflorescence, how many insects visit? And remember, I'm sampling two inflorescences per bush, and there are 10 different bushes with different lantana abundance, flower abundance. So that's 1A. 1B, I have three different bushes that I sample. One has 40, one has 100, one has 400. Now, but the difference here is that in each of these three, I sample 20 inflorescences, which means I watch each of those 20 inflorescences for half an hour and note down how many insects visit these uh, inflorescences, each of these inflorescences. So here too, I get a per inflorescence number of visitors. So I want you to look at these two different, because remember, there's only so much time I can spend watching uh, these inflorescences. So in one case, I've got these 20 different bushes and two inflorescences per bush. In another case, I have three different bushes and 20 inflorescences per bush. So quickly, if you can jot down in the chat box, you know, you can write 1A, either a problem or a merit, and 1B, either a problem or a merit that you see with these, with these study designs. And then we'll talk about, uh, we'll discuss those and talk about how, you know, ideally one should be improving this. So I'm going to give you half a minute, 30 seconds for this.
Okay, I'll give another half minute. Just jot down what comes to your mind and then we can discuss this. So let's discuss what uh, people have mentioned. Um, as mentioned by uh, some, in 1A, the problem is that since we are, so 1A, the nice thing is if we want to know how does the abundance of lantana flowers uh, in the neighborhood, you know, how does the abundance of lantana flowers, how does it affect how many uh, visitors come to these lantana flowers? Uh, the nice thing is that we are actually having a nice range all the way from very low flower abundance to very high flower abundance. This is very important, especially if, um, you know, there is a nonlinear relationship, meaning, for example, maybe it increases up to 40 and then stays completely the same. So after 40 flowers, basically having more flowers doesn't really uh, increase how many visitors come to you. That's important to know because that will tell you something about the costs and benefits to Lantana for producing so many flowers. But as you've pointed out, one problem here is that only two inflorescences are being uh, sampled uh, per bush. So maybe that's not enough to represent, especially in a case with like 1600 flower inflorescences, just recording how, you know, number of insects per inflorescence for just two of them may not be representative and uh, there they might just be so much variability that we may not get a good estimate. Absolutely. So that problem is taken care of in 1B. So in 1B, since we are looking at 20 flowers per plant, that's great. So per plant, we are getting a good estimate. Problem with, um, there are two problems at least with 1B. First of all, it's only three plants in this whole forest. So again, those three plants may not represent um, you know, these the Lantana population well. And secondly, we are just having three levels, 40, 100, 400. What if by 40, maybe the main benefits are 1 to 40. That's where you see an increase in uh, insect visitors and afterwards you don't. So in which case, if that's a problem, <coughs> excuse me, you may, you may wrongly conclude that flower abundance does not affect how many visitors come there. So ideally, we should know the range of lantana flowers, uh, the lantana flower abundance, have multiple plants along this range. And, you know, like in 1A, but say with many more plants, you know, uh, and uh, sample multiple inflorescences per plant. So, and if our time is constrained, we have to figure out, you know, watching uh, individual inflorescences, how do we allocate time towards that versus watching multiple uh, bushes and uh, there's been there was one more point about replicating this in multiple areas that would be important to ask you know is this uh, is the pattern that we are seeing is that general or is it restricted to one particular kind of environment absolutely so here is a second kind of approach which is now, you know, you could criticize my previous study saying, um, you know, what if insects are coming? What if more insects are coming to the 1600 plant? Not because there are more uh, uh, inflorescences there, but only because say that's in an area with an open canopy and, you know, the, the sun loving butterflies come there a lot. So the visits are not because of the flowers. It's because of something else that's correlated. No, correlation is not causation, right? So maybe increased insect visits has to do with some habitat structure or something completely different, not to do with lantana abundance. And lantana abundance, flower abundance is correlated with the same thing. Lantana flowers more in openings in the canopy, more insects come where there are openings in the canopy, 
Therefore, you see more insects on Lantara. One way around it is to carry out some form of manipulation experiment. So that's what I'm setting out to do now. What I'm going to do is to set up low and high flower neighborhoods. And I am experimentally setting it up. So it can't be because of this open canopy, etc. I'm controlling for all that, right? Because I am actually changing. So what I'm going to do is by snipping off lantana inflorescences in 2A on the same plant, I'm going to create a high lantana neighborhood with um, uh, there's going to be like 40 inflorescences there and then a low lantana neighborhood with 20 inflorescences there. So that pink patch is uh, the darker patch is high lantana 40. The lighter yellowish patch is low lantana 20. Then I'll watch them for half an hour and look at number of insect visitors to each flower, to each inflorescence per hour. And I'll do this, I'll replicate this on 10 different bushes in different parts of the forest. In 2B, it's going to be similar. I am going to create the densities, flower densities. Again, uh, high and low flower densities, but now I'm going to put them on different bushes that are at least 100 meters apart. Again, there are going to be at least, there are going to be 10 high neighborhood bushes and 10 low neighborhood bushes. So total sample size of 20. And then I'm going to watch them and get number of visitors per inflorescence per hour. So again, just look at these two um, uh, designs and tell me, you know, can you think of the advantage? You know, would you prefer 2A or would you prefer 2B and why? Just even one reason. If you had a choice, would you go with 2A or 2B and why? So I'll just give you 30 seconds for that. So the thing to be thinking of is, you know, you're experimentally creating these neighborhoods. What's the advantage of having them side by side on the same plant? What's the disadvantage? What's the problem? Is there a problem with that? What's the advantage of having them separate on different plants? Is there a problem with that? So Yogesh, you said you would, uh, if you can unmute and just explain, uh, I didn't understand what 2B as a control and 2A would mean. If you're able to, if you're able to unmute. And others something, just at least put whether you like 2A or 2B. I'm just curious which uh, one you put so Basically, my point yeah. was that, uh, so we are studying about uh, we are, uh, the question we are interested in is whether the abundance of these flowers in a neighborhood uh, would increase the visitation. So, yes. so what? So when we have a low density, a low number of flowers and a high number of flowers within the same bush, uh, the higher number of flowers could attract more uh, uh, insects, or uh, it could it could sort of increase the visitation. I mean, I, I hypothesize that it would increase the visitation. 
but then when these uh, two passes are separated by 100 meters which is a uh, uh, quite a large distance for uh, in terms of an insect insect scale uh, does what how much uh, insects to visit the high high flowers or the low flowers so this could mm. give us a sort of a difference in some sense that whether the number of flowers in a bush helps us uh, uh, is giving the attraction or mm. does it being together does the abundance of these flowers within the same bush uh, have a significantly higher number of visitation than if they are apart so that's what i meant by we could have we could conduct both and have one result as a control and the other as a a problem so you mean whether what's happening in the high patch is affecting what's happening in the low patch when it's side by side on the same bush yes ma'am that's what you mean yes ma'am yeah yeah so i think somebody else has also um uh mentioned this which is um yeah i think 2a and 2b would have a, a kind of uh, different uh, sets of advantages and problems in 2a because we are putting them on the same plant um you know if there are plant by plant differences say in nectar quality or something else that can attract insects um then that is controlled for because both the high and the low neighborhoods are uh, experiencing the same nectar quality or the canopy over the plant or any other plant level condition but uh, the problem like a couple of you mentioned is that insects come to visit the high density patch and they can spill over into the low density so then we don't know what could the response of the insect to the low density be independent of what's happening in the high density patch in 2b the second problem is taken care of because low density is separated from high density it's not like insects uh, coming to high density spill over into the low density so that you know what's happening at low density should not be should not be correlated or affected by what's happening at high density but because they are on separate plants all these other confounding factors can come in maybe the high density plant is you know in a gap in the canopy low density plant is you know canopy completely covered so maybe because of uh, things like that uh, that can also affect how many insects come what that will do is increase the variability so basically in 2b you'll need a larger sample size than in 2a which controls for conditions but in 2a you have to think about how far apart your neighborhoods should be so that they don't affect each other because the two treatments should not affect each other okay so if you have any other questions about this i'll keep continuing but do uh, put in any points in the chat box and i can always um, uh, address them later i'll also stop in 10 minutes i'll just stop and in case there are particular questions you can also unmute and ask okay so um the next kind of important part about um choosing sampling units that i wanted to talk to you about is randomizing so once we decide you know i want to you know i want a sample size of 30 or 50 or 100 or 10 or whatever it is how do i go about selecting these sampling units and you know usually you'll have people say you know you should do random sampling so what random sampling means is that all your potential sampling units have a similar chance of being selected and why do we do this we don't you know we do this so that we get an unbiased sample because we want to be able to generalize to the whole population not to one biased subset of that population but randomizing is very difficult so let me give you two examples so suppose what i want to do is measure photosynthetic rates of trees in a forest and trees are wonderful they don't move they don't go anywhere so i can find them easily so you have this huge forest with like uh, thousands of trees in it of this particular species but estimating photosynthetic rates is uh, takes a lot of effort maybe i can only do 30 trees how do i select 30 trees from this uh, huge uh, forest one possible way is i could just select uh, you know ideally if i can give a number to all those thousands of trees i can then pick a number at random 
but that i can't do you know I, even estimating how many trees are there is very difficult and giving all of them numbers is logistically not possible so i might need kind of um that you know rules sampling rules that i think will allow me to randomly select these trees so here's one rule so what i'm going to do is um i'm going to just choose coordinates at random so an x and a y coordinate at random so say suppose i get an x and a y coordinate here then i got that then what do i do i go to the nearest tree and select that tree that's the nearest tree and like that i do um say you know i can maybe measure 30 trees so i select 30 different um coordinates at random i go to the nearest tree and measure it there is a problem here if trees were uniformly distributed in the population the routine i have told you will allow me to randomly select without a problem but trees are usually not uniformly uh, distributed in a population even if there's no competition nothing like that just random events like you know there's a tree fall here um you know something has happened elephants bumped into a tree somewhere else things like that will result in trees being heterogeneously distributed in some places they're going to be a bit more clumped in some places they're going to be bit more sparse what that means is that trees in low density areas like this tree here is going to be picked the area over which i put points which will allow this to be picked is much larger than a tree in a high density clump which basically means the strategy that i described to you is biased towards low density trees so if i measure photosynthetic rates i am represent it's going to be biased towards trees that are in low density areas and maybe density matters maybe because of uh, competition within the same species intraspecific competition maybe because of such competition photosynthetic rates actually depend on density in which case i don't have a um, estimate that's representing the whole population i have an estimate that's biased towards low density areas i hope that's clear here's another um, situation suppose i am sampling fish in a group i want to look at some behavior that they are doing and these fish are moving about in some you know natural shallow uh, stream how do and i can't follow all the fish how do i select individuals at random again if i can i should catch all of them give them all say tag numbers or something and then i can you know pull them out of a hat or you know i can randomly select an individual what if i can't catch them and put colors or tags on them but i have to like you know they are uh, swimming in front of me and i have to randomly select one individual follow it for 10 minutes then randomly select another individual it can get pretty tough if i use a rule like you know i'll uh, start from the periphery and then go towards the center certain parts of the group are going to get um, you know have a higher chance of uh, being picked than certain other parts so because of this we have to think very clearly about what kind of uh, randomizing routine can we use that will actually give all the sampling units a fair chance of being sampled so for example because we don't have time i can't go into what would be the best for each situation but say back to the trees in the forest because you know like i said trees don't move much easier um we could you know grid up the forest choose grids at random and then select uh, the the number of sampling number of trees to sample we can select more in areas with higher density of trees so that you know uh, we uh, make sure that trees across different densities have a similar chance of being sampled something like that for example there are other possible ways also but here's one uh, simple way of doing it now the second point that i want to make so the first point was randomizing is tough the second point is in fact maybe very often we don't even want true randomization remember true randomization means all individuals have an equal chance of being picked but what happens when your sample size is small 
तो सपोज आई कैन ओनली मेजर सिक्स ट्रीज जस्ट बाय चांस आई माइट और से फाइव ट्रीज हेयर जस्ट बाय चांस बिकॉज ऑफ द लक ऑफ द ड्रॉ I might pick four trees in high density areas and one tree in low density area. So now my estimate is biased towards high density areas. So this is the same problem. Like you know, even with a fair coin, if you toss the coin ten times, your chances of getting all heads or all tails is much higher than if you uh, toss the coin a hundred times or a thousand times. so with small sample sizes getting these peculiar configurations um is uh, the chances of getting that are much higher so especially when you have small sample sizes true randomization may not work so in this case if i suspect that um tree density is important i might want to stratify divide up the forest in grids according to the density and then pick at random within grids with different densities or if i don't even know what is changing in different areas i might just say i want to systematically cover the whole forest so i'll grid it up into four big plots and then in each plot i'll measure uh, 10 or something like that that way i have at least covered the coverage is good that's another possibility here's another example so this goes back to our grassland and black buck you know feeding on grasses and so on so just to make things a bit more complicated suppose i'm you know like there i'm looking at the effect of grazing on plant communities so then i have these fenced off areas for large herbivores like black buck and then i have these fenced off areas for smaller herbivores um so the ex exclosure l is fenced off areas where black buck cannot go in but other small herbivores like hares for example can go in the exclosure s is where black buck can't go in small herbivores also can't go in and the c the c are these open plots in the grassland where both large herbivores and small herbivores can go in so now how did i place these i randomly picked spots in the grassland again as you can see as people brought up before just by chance because my sample size is so small most of my large herbivore exclosures landed up in the top right part and most of my controls are on the left left half of this grassland now if there's any kind of gradient soil moisture gradient soil nutrient gradient uh, livestock grazing i mean not livestock grazing something else some other environmental gradient then i could get a difference between the large exclosures and control which has nothing to do with grazing but has to do with this unknown unknown correlated um variable condition in this grassland so what would be the way out um again depending on how many plots i can put i might want to divide up the grassland uh, broadly say into 4 or 8 or depending on the size of the grids uh, grassland i'll put out these grids in each grid i can choose a point at random and then place all three treatments suitably separated so that they are not affecting each other suitably separated but also then i have one block of large small control another block of large small control that way i make sure that all treatments are experiencing all these different conditions in the grassland so such systematic random sampling stratified random sampling such routines are commonly used in ecology true randomization is actually very rarely used okay so to summarize what are the ways out you know these problems that true randomization can bring up if you know the gradient like tree density i knew that density was a, a confounding factor i can stratify by density randomly sample within each strata if i don't know but i suspect that there is variation i can block them like in the grassland example where i had one block of treatments here another block of treatments here and so on okay a couple of last few points before we move on to uh, statistics i wanted to start statistics about uh, 12 o'clock or 5 past 12 when we choose these conditions that we are interested in what i have called predictors when we choose these conditions that we are interested in 
it's very very important that we have to make sure these conditions are not correlated what does that mean so again this has to do with choosing your sampling units so suppose i'm interested in tree species richness why are there so many trees in one patch so many different species of trees in one patch and you know in comparison there are fewer or more or whatever i'm interested in that variation and i'm interested in the effect of two factors rainfall so i expect that with greater rainfall there's greater productivity and so higher tree species richness but disturbance can also affect tree species richness so i want to know what's the relative importance of rainfall and disturbance on tree species richness i go out there and i measure some 15 20 communities and what i find is that as rainfall increases these are the data as rainfall increases tree species richness increases as it happens as disturbance increases tree species richness also increases so does this mean both rainfall and disturbance have strong impacts on how many tree species are seen in an area no because in my data set here is the problem rainfall and disturbance are correlated meaning where in areas with low, low rainfall there's also low disturbance area with high rainfall there's also high disturbance so now i cannot tease apart are there more tree species because of disturbance or because of rainfall so this is the problem when the things you are interested in here rainfall and disturbance when those conditions that you want to test if they are correlated this is the problem so ideally i would want the situation on the left of your screen which is i'd want to sample tree communities in low disturbance low rainfall low disturbance high rainfall all the way to low disturbance i'm sorry high disturbance high rainfall high disturbance low rainfall meaning all these different combinations instead what i had is the graph on the right which is high correlation between these two factors whose effects on trees i'm interested in so where possible we have to try in our study design to go to try and get that that top left graph not the top right how can we do this if this is an experimental study that's uh, actually easy we can create combinations um so for example if i can actually if i'm looking at say fire as a disturbance and i can actually do you know two small setting fire plots people do these kinds of experiments controlled uh fires i could try and make sure that i have different combinations of rainfall and disturbance if i cannot very often in ecology we cannot carry out experiments we have to work with observational studies where we work with the natural variation then what i can do is do a preliminary survey find these combinations and some of these combinations may actually be very rare it may be very rare to find for example um um uh, very high rainfall and very high disturbance perhaps i'm just saying so we'd have to really search find these combinations stratify by combinations then randomize if we did true randomization what would happen is we'd have most of our data points from the common conditions and the rare combinations would not be represented so in an observational study a preliminary survey where you you know find where these different conditions are and then you randomly sample within these different combinations uh, will work that's the that's a strategy that will work okay and remember you know often we think oh doesn't matter statistics will help us later no statistics nothing can be done if you have strongly correlated predictor variables nothing can be done what you can say is either rainfall or disturbance or some combination of the two affects tree species richness for that previous study that is the you know strongest conclusion i can come to or a third variable that i have not measured again because correlation is not causation okay so now we are going to switch to something slightly different mostly because i want to show you a uh, video so that we all wake up a bit which is a quick point about what to measure you know once you've decided what your study is what to measure and i want to illustrate this point with a short video so remember i said you know right at the beginning i'd shown you this photo and said what if i'm studying these antelope 
and you know these antelope you can see i don't know if you can see the male in the front has his ears down he has his tail up he's kind of bristled his hair so that it's looking blacker and then he'd also do this walk that's supposed to be energetically costly so that's a display walk that males do and different males perform these display behaviors to different levels so suppose i'm interested in understanding this costly behavior why is there variation among males in costly behavior so let me explain some of the hypotheses with a video let's hope this works so what you're seeing here is a black buck lek that's where males gather and defend territories there's no food or water on these territories it's just these individual males displaying on their territories females visit these leks move among males mate with one or more males and leave okay so now you can see these two males doing that display walk i was telling you about they also you know start fighting so these display walks one possibility is that they are used in male male competition and uh, this competition can get quite bad actually so males can actually uh, have these uh, intense fights that can go on for 20 minutes half an hour you know i've also seen one male kind of gored by the uh, horn of another male so these fights can get costly but what you'll see next is a male this is very early in the morning so the light conditions are not great uh, but this male is performing the same behavior now to a female during courtship and so another possibility is that this display behavior has some role in courtship so maybe males who perform this behavior for longer are chosen by females maybe it's a cue in mate choice you can also see females fighting with each other in the black uh, background so the reason i wanted to show you that video is to emphasize that you know in our minds we have this question like you know i am really interested in black buck i'm thinking okay there's this display behavior it's very costly um why why is there variation in this behavior maybe it's because some males experience more competition so they perform more of it others don't or maybe it's because uh, you know some males are doing this to attract females and so on but remember what i'm then what i'm um, confronted with is this lack there's so much is going on there are so many males at the peak there can be 120 males whom do i select what do i measure and all of this happens in uh, you know 21 days or 30 days and uh, males there is turnover in males you know 3 days later somebody new is there there are females coming through the lake the females are fighting with each other the females are visiting males they're moving from one male to another so there's a lot happening there and i have to have a plan in hand otherwise i'd go there and just be completely overwhelmed by all the activity so i have to figure out ahead of time for my question what are the things i need to measure because i could just watching that keep measuring more things or oh, maybe i should measure the horn length maybe males with longer horns also display more or maybe i should uh, measure body size maybe males who are larger display more or you know or maybe what i should measure is uh, how much food there is on that male's territory that little bit of grass because maybe if he has that he can have more energy and display more so on the spot i can keep thinking of things to measure but the more and more things i measure remember i need a larger sample size to be able to tease apart the importance of different variables and to estimate that well i'll also need more observation time um and i'll also need to make sure that i'm recording all of it systematically so the important thing you know when quickly i mean this is a, a long topic but just to give you a few important points is that we need to make our research question clear because depending on the precise question suppose i'm interested in the relative effects of male density and female density on display because i want to know whether displays are more important in the context of female choice or in the context of competition with males then those are the main things to measure so i need to make my research question clear ideally before i go and start formally recording data i should use literature or my intuition or preliminary observations of the study system to decide what to measure we should avoid this shotgun approach of just measuring everything possible everything you can see 
because that will add a lot of noise to the data. That approach is okay if this is the first step and you're exploring. But it's not okay if you want to strongly test your hypothesis. Okay, so let me quickly sum up this part. And, you know, um, uh, the, of course, there are lots of aspects I've not been able to talk about, like, for example, the idea of controls and so on. But I do want to talk to you for uh, half an hour or 40 minutes about statistics. So I'm going to sum up this part and point out again that what we are aiming for is generalization, meaning going from sample to population. We are aiming for reliability, meaning the answer that we get. We are confident that if we do the study again, we are going to get a similar reliable answer and causal inference. That is where we want to say A causes B. Now, we had talked about replication, sample sizes, and sample sizes are important both for generalization to represent the population well. Randomization is also really important to represent the population well for us to generalize to the whole population, not to some biased subsets of the population and appropriate scale. We talked about thinking about, you know, if you want to study a question about colonies, you have to sample multiple colonies, not just more and more nests within the colony. So we have to think about the scale. For reliability, meaning when you go back, you get a similar answer. Uh, the idea there is our answer should be precise. And we'll come back to this in the statistics part when we talk about confidence intervals. For this, sample size is really important and taking care of confounding variables, other things that can affect the main relationship we are looking at. You know, taking care of noise, taking care of correlations, taking care of measurement er error. That's what will help us get to a precise answer. When we talk about causal inferences, an experiment will give you stronger causal inferences than observational studies, but all of us in ecology do observational studies all the time. And there are ways of making sure, you know, by making sure we get correct combinations of the conditions we are interested in, by making sure we are testing multiple well-chosen predictions, by increasing sample size, taking care of confounding variables and so on. Even in an observational study, we can come up with strong causal inferences. Okay, so from here, we are going to move on to statistical inference. So just to give, you know, I'm just going to take a two minute break. So it's 12, 10 now. This two minute break is just so that we can rest our minds from study design and then move on to statistical inference. So literally just a two minute break to kind of refresh ourselves.
Hi everyone. Let's continue. Yeah. So, like I said, we are going to switch now from talking about study design to talking about another key element of doing research in ecology, evolution, behavior, and conservation, which is now that you know you've you've got this question, you've designed your study beautifully, you've collected data. Now we typically use statistical methods with these data. So what I'm going to talk to you about very briefly here is to give you a sense of why, why we use statistical methods. What are we commonly seeking to do when we use statistical methods? How do we decide what statistical uh, approach to take or what statistical test to use? Meaning, how do we think through that? So let's first see why do we use statistical methods? And the answer goes back like in study design because we want to gain reliable, generalizable knowledge. So we want to make inferences about the population from the sample, from sample to population. And the problem is if we just eyeball the data, you know, visually try to make out is there a difference, is there a relationship? You and I might have different opinions on whether something is increasing or decreasing or if there's a large difference or if there's a small difference. So statistical methods provide a tool if used well, provide a tool that allow us to try to get to relatively objective answers up for going from sample to the population. So for example, uh, you see this uh, rock lizard there. Um, and the individual on the left is a male, the individual on the right is a female. If I'm interested in asking if there's sexual size dimorphism, meaning is there a difference in the body size of males and females? Uh, I measure the snout to vent length and I have a whole bunch of data that I'm showing you in this graph. And you can see the individual data points for males, individual data points for females. So I might want to use, to use statistical methods to ask how much do mean sizes between males and females? How much is this difference? How precisely have I been able to estimate this difference? Does this really represent a difference? Or, you know, if I just go and measure 20 males and then 20 other males the next day, they are going to be different. Is the difference I'm seeing representing something biologically interesting or is it a difference I could have just got by chance. Similarly, I just talked to you about males displaying and how that might help them attract more females. The number of mates also called male mating success. I go and I watch different black buck, many different individuals and I measure their display rate. How often they perform that costly display and I'm again showing you data here on how many females they mated with and how much they displayed. There is some pattern here. Does this represent an increasing pattern? My hypothesis is if they display more, they should get more females, higher mating success. Is there in fact an increasing pattern or could a pattern like this just have been obtained by chance? Those are the kinds of things I'm trying to do when I use statistical methods. So, to again explain more concretely the kinds of things we estimate from data, let me follow up with that lizard example that I showed you. So here what you see is this uh, species, this rock lizard called Samophilus dorsalis. The individual on the top is a male. You know, he's displaying with orange and black. The individual below is a female. And uh, in this uh, population that we've been studying, uh, we catch and we uh, tag individuals, we measure them, and then we either carry out some observations on them depending on our question, or we can also carry out field experiment. So for the purposes of making the points related to statistics today, I'm going to address this question, which is um, these males, uh, you know, they perform all these aggressive behaviors. They carry out these, uh, you know, they uh, puff out their throats, it's called angular extension. They gape their mouths. They, you know, show these different color patterns. Um, you know, they might bite individuals, pounce on them and so on. 
so imagine that i am carrying out a field experiment to test ideas about male male competition now remember showing aggressive behavior is actually quite costly because uh, you have to invest energy in showing aggressive behavior plus if you actually fight if you start a fight you could get injured in it so one hypothesis in the literature is that aggression should be strategic meaning individuals should carry out more aggressive behavior when the benefits from doing so are higher meaning if their territory so these individuals are found on these uh, small territories that are centered around perches these uh, what we call perches but basically these are rocks or boulders that these individuals perch on and spend a lot of their time on and these rocks and boulders seem to be really important so in this picture for example you can see um you know you can see this male here and then you can see this female here on this different perch and um, you know the idea is that for this male to engage in competitive behavior uh, he should uh, he should be expected to do so when the threat is high versus when the threat is low because when the th threat is low uh, the benefits are small but the costs can be high so what we what i have shown you here is a this is a model placed here and uh, we've carried out these experiments say where we uh, place these models in high value areas of the territory and low value areas and then we look at how male uh, males respond to this threat now here are the data right at this this is simulated data for the purpose of this uh, uh, discussion my question like i told you is you know i expect strategic investment in aggressive behavior because aggressive behavior is costly they should only do it when the benefits from doing so are high so my question is are resident males more aggressive when the threat is high and in the graph below you can see there are two treatments low threat level that is simulated in this field experiment high threat level simulated and the question is um how does aggressive behavior compare so again to remind you we use statistics to make inferences about population from sample as objectively as possible so what are the things i would now quantify i would want to know the size of the effect so you'll often hear this term effect size what that means is here i'm interested in the difference between treatment 1 and treatment 2 i might want to know how large is this difference between uh, low threat level and high threat level do they you know increase the number of behave the rate of these aggressive behaviors does it double does it go from 5 per hour to 10 per hour or is it marginally only different so the size of the effect is perhaps the first thing i might quantify now if there i had two categories two treatments so i could uh, look at a difference instead sometimes the question will involve continuous variables more continuous variables so for example i might predict that when i do this experiment individuals who are smaller in body size may not actually invest so much in aggressive behavior because they might actually uh, you know uh, lose out on an interaction that starts because of the aggressive behavior they show so i might actually also want to know whether the body size of the lizard affects the proportion of time they spend in aggressive behavior and here the size of the effect will um, you know will refer to whether there is a strong correlation the graph to your right shows a strong correlation between body size and how much aggressive behavior they perform whereas the graph to your left shows that there seem to be other things that seem to matter it's not just body size the correlation is not very strong things apart from body size affect the proportion of time they spend in aggressive behavior because for the same body size you have a range in aggression in aggressive behavior the size of the effect can also refer to the slope of the relationship so you know when individuals go from being say um 10 cm to 15 cm this proportion of time spent in aggressive behavior goes up a lot in this graph 
in this graph it does not go up by much meaning that body size is not resulting in a large increase in aggressive behavior so that is what in this case we would term effect size or the size of the effect now what i have shown you here in this graph is the mean aggressive behavior in low threat and high threat the problem is just this mean what we often call a point estimate just these means are not enough for us to conclude if there's a difference it seems to be a difference here between these means but what if i did the study again if i did this study over and over again and if i got values like this the so second time i do the study i get this third time i do the study i get this fourth time i do the study i get this fifth time and so on what this tells me oops sorry what this tells me is that consistently there is a difference in aggressive behavior tailored to threat level so aggressive behavior this will give strong support to the hypothesis that individuals will invest in this aggressive behavior depending on how threatening the situation is but what think of this other situation um you know what we had was this was the first mean right this was the first mean now i'm doing the study again i get this i'm doing the study again i get this fourth time i get this fifth time i get this so if you look at the crosses now on that graph what the suggested is in fact males don't really change their aggressive behavior depending on the threat level of the intruder it just happened that in once in the study we got this big difference but if we repeat it over and over again it seems like you know sometimes it's uh, more for the low threat level and high uh, than the high threat level sometimes it's the other way so actually there's no difference the so apart from the mean aggressive behavior we need a measure that tells us how precisely have we been able to measure this effect that is if we repeat the study are we going to get similar results or very different results and that's where measures of variation are very important a commonly used measure that i want to just talk about are these confidence intervals so again to remind you you know when you have data say lots of males you measure the aggressive behavior we often measure what's called standard deviation standard deviation represents the variation in the sample using the standard deviation we then calculate something called the standard error so the standard error is not about the spread of the data in the sample standard error helps us get this precision estimate of precision so obviously you know i can't go back and do the study on lizards a thousand times right to see whether consistently high is always high threat level has more aggression than low threat level i can't do the study a thousand times usually we'll do the study once because just to get a proper sample size might take us 2 3 years we'll do the study once however we can use the variation in the data points to get at measures of uncertainty of also called measures of confidence meaning the intuition behind confidence interval is okay i have this one mean aggression level uh, times i mean proportion of times pattern aggression for low and high threat levels but what is the plausible range of values that the unknown population parameter is likely to take meaning what is the plausible range in aggression levels of lizards under low and high threat levels and i can use the data the information in the data to calculate standard errors and then confidence intervals and the confidence interval is defined um Uh, you know technically represents if we were to repeat the study many 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 times the true population parameter will occur within these intervals 95% of the time so it's the percentage of all intervals that contains the population parameter of course we don't do the study many times we 
use information in the data so we have say 30 lizards under low threat level measured 30 lizards under high threat levels measured if we think that aggressive behavior is normally distributed we can use a formula based on the normal distribution accounting for the variation in the data so it's the mean plus or minus say 1.96 times standard error if you want the 95 percent confidence interval forget the formula the idea is you can use the variation in the data to estimate how precisely you have measured aggression levels if you have precise levels then you can be confident these are different if you have very imprecise levels then you know you can't really say whether uh, threat level affects aggression or not so just to explain this you know with uh, concrete values what we are doing when we calculate something like confidence intervals is we ask ourselves how precisely have i been able to measure the effect and i want to give you three examples to explain why this is important so suppose remember i told you that we have this size and so what we have is body size here and we have aggressive behavior and i said as body size increases we expect aggressive behavior to increase. Now, suppose the size effect, if you look in these all these three examples, the size effect is exactly the same, right? It's just saying, you know, you get a slope of 0.2 perhaps. In the first case, we have a very narrow confidence interval. This is telling us that if we keep repeating the study, we are going to get size effects somewhere in the range of 0.18 to 0.23. So the confidence interval is actually fairly narrow. But look at the second example. Second example says the confidence interval, the size effect can range from cases where, so this the mean size effect is still the same, but it's saying that the size effect can vary from cases which are very shallow, meaning very small in increases in aggressive behavior to extremely steep so oops, oops sorry oh sorry sorry yeah to extremely steep meaning that for a small increase in body size you're seeing a huge increase in aggression so we've not been able to estimate it well we don't know if body size actually has only a negligible effect on aggressive behavior or a very high effect on aggressive behavior so basically we don't have a good answer as good an answer as in the first case look at the third case there again mean effect is the same but now the confidence interval is saying that it could range it could range from even negative slightly negative to very positive um, minus 0.1 meaning as body size increases aggression actually goes down so this is even more imprecise it's including negative effect, flat slope is no effect, and positive effect. So the confidence, without the confidence interval, we would just say as size increases, aggression increases. It's only because we've got the confidence interval along with the mean effect that we are able to say in the first case, yes, there is evidence that body size affects aggression quite well. No, there is some evidence, but we don't know how much. It could be negligible. It could be very high. Third case, not really because you get negative and positive values included in the confidence interval. So I hope this shows you why just that mean estimate is not sufficient for us to come to conclusions about the processes we are interested in. We need measures of precision or confidence or uncertainty. Uh, that's the kind of complementary way of looking at it. OK, so confidence intervals are extremely important. It's a kind of uh, basic aspect of uh, statistics in uh, our field that everyone should have a feel for. If you have any question from now, you know, in the next 15, 20 minutes, do put it down in the chat box or unmute and ask. No problem. This is a 
this concept and the next one that I'm going to explain to you are just two key concepts that should be very, very clear to you. Just like the difference between standard deviations and standard error. Okay. So the next kind of ingredient in a statistical approach that is uh, very commonly seen is statistical hypothesis testing. And the reason we use this is to try and figure out whether, you know, when we are looking at whether um, aggressive behavior differs between low threat level and high threat level, we have these data that I'm showing you. But could these data just, you know, also be seen just by charts? Meaning, even if I measured another set of individuals under low threat, I'm not going to get the same distribution of data. I'm either going to get slightly higher values or slightly lower values. Does the situation I'm showing you here represent that kind of random fluctuation? Or does it represent a true difference? And we try to get at it through statistical hypothesis testing. And the idea very briefly, the idea uh, here is we are asking what I've shown you are you know, data as a frequency distributions. That is, if I measure aggressive behavior over and over and over again, uh, I calculate the mean each time. I do this study many, many, many times. And I plot the mean aggressive behavior of under low threat situation and under high threat situation. What I'm trying to assess is, are these two, are these two different populations or do low and high, you know, the way individuals behave, aggressive behavior, do they come from the same population? That's what I'm trying to assess. And what we do is we ask ourselves, if I repeat the study many, many, many times, and if there's truly no difference, so this is my null distribution that I'm showing you here. If there's really no difference between low and high threat levels, then obviously I won't get, say, zero difference between low mean and high mean. If I do low mean minus high mean, obviously I'm not going to get a value that's zero, right? Because, you know, two samples are not going to have exactly the same values. The question is, if I repeatedly get low mean, mean of low threat value, mean of high threat value, what are the kinds of differences I'll get? I'm going to get tiny differences, right? Sometimes low threat level, the mean will be higher, you know, might be uh, 0.1. Sometimes it's going to be minus 0.1 and so on. If there is really no difference between low threat level and high threat level, I should get values close to zero. Occasionally, I'll get values that are more extreme. So what I'm going to judge now is under this null distribution that most of the time we get small negligible values, occasionally very large values. Let me judge where the observed difference lies. Is the observed difference much larger than what we expect under the null distribution, what we expect at random, or is it small enough that we think it's random fluctuation? That's what we are trying to assess. So we have this what's called a null hypothesis mean one equals mean two. What I've shown you is this expected difference under the null. Like I said, we'll never get a value of a difference exactly zero. So we are going to get values, you know, some, you know, even if there's no difference between low and high, occasionally we are going to get values here, uh, you know, uh, low being larger than high. Occasionally high will be larger than low. Very, very, very rarely, if we were to do the study to the, you know, thousand times, occasionally we might get a very large value, but most of the time we should get very small differences between low threat values and high threat values. Of course, we don't do a study many times. What we are doing is we are using assumptions about how differences these kinds of statistics are distributed. If we think these statistics are distributed normally, we'll compare our standardized difference to a normal distribution 
and say okay if i got a standardized uh, you know if i got a uh, difference of 3 here is a difference how likely is it to get a difference of 3 or more under the null hypothesis so the probability of getting 3 or more a difference of 3 or more under the null hypothesis is tiny it's in the tails of the distribution so i infer that my um, uh, that getting such a difference is not very common under the null and therefore i reject the null you can either reject the null or fail to reject the null you cannot accept the null the reason being that maybe your sample size wasn't good enough you didn't detect the effect there are many reasons why there could really be a difference between a and b but we just not detected it so we never accept the null we either reject the null or we fail to reject the null and as you can see there are two problems that can happen the null might be true that is uh, really males under low threat situation and high threat situation do the same aggressive behavior but what happens we are in you know that one out of uh, you know if you put that uh, probability level of 5% that we often do saying p less than 0.05 maybe we are in that one rare case where by chance because of our the samples that we landed up with we got that occasional very small chance of getting a large difference even completely at random so we reject the null even when it's true that's called type one error the opposite problem is in three but there's so much else going on there are females in the audience around them there are predators flying so because of all that there's so much noise that we don't have a large enough sample size to detect this difference so we re we fail to reject the null we say no there's no difference between low threat and high threat even when there truly is a difference that's the second kind of error that you can do which is a false negative the first one is a false positive the second one is a false negative it's for these reasons that oh just to show you like you know the case where we are looking at the difference in aggressive behavior between the low threat and high threat situations you know if we did a t test and we got a p of 0.3 that means we say the probability of getting you know a value like this is actually very high so meaning the null could very well represent the situation this kind of a result we could get just at random therefore we fail to reject the null and we conclude that males behave similarly or at least we can't detect a difference on the other hand if you get a result you know t equals 3.38 p equals 0.002 then we say okay the probability of getting this result that we got 3.38 is very tiny it's not really uh, you know well represented under the null uh, getting values like 3.38 or more extreme under the null hypothesis is very very rare so um, you know um, we conclude that the null doesn't really rep represent the situation well this couldn't really you know it's unlikely to have come up by chance so we reject the null and infer that there seems to be a difference but again remember it like i told you because of the problems that you can get false positives and false negatives we have to be cautious we have to be cautious and remember that statistical significance is not biological significance so just to again emphasize that imagine that i'm a wildlife manager okay and i have this budget with me i can build fences in crop fields around surrounding crop fields or i can do some other mitigation measure in response to crop damage by these black buck these black buck come damage crops and people get unhappy and then they are you know uh, not really positive about conservation of black buck so i want to try out different mitigation measures and one suggestion people have given is why not fence crop fields so but it's costly so before i decide to do that versus something else i carry out an experiment so i have some crop fields which i fence and others i don't fence and then i look at the effect of fencing how large is this effect of fencing by how much does it reduce uh, damage and this is what i find so a b and c are in red 
there are three cases a b and c are three cases where i applied a statistical test and found no difference d e and f are a case where i applied a statistical test and i did find a difference so a b c no difference d e f i did find a difference according to a statistical test like a p less than 0.05 for d e f p greater than 0.05 for a b and c now i have also given you more information the squares show you the mean effect size that is by how much did uh, crop damage uh, uh, you know what's the difference between unprotected and protected fields so a larger value means more damage where there's no fence small value means less um, you know the difference between uh, unfenced and fenced is not very high at all so where there's a big big value means it's very effective the fence small value means fence is not so effective the lines the bars that you see are confidence intervals um so that tells you what's the range of you know how precisely have i been able to measure it if i were to do the study again what is the range of plausible values i would get about how effective this fence is i just wanted to take 30 seconds and tell me of these suppose you had to uh, decide on um say you had to decide on three three populations where you know three of these situations where you will now invest in fencing you are going to go and actually buy those costly fences which are they which are the three situations will you choose abc def aef bdf which three if you had to choose three of these situations where as a wildlife manager you are going to go and put this costly fencing which three will you use just look at this 30 seconds no problem you can write a b c d e f b c d c e f whatever you like but i want to see at least three responses in the chat box so that i can see how people are thinking this through and as we'll discuss there is actually no very clear answer so abc remember statistical hypothesis test said p greater than 0.05 meaning statistically there is no difference but what is also shown to you is the mean effectiveness of the friend, uh, fence larger value means more effective and the confidence interval tells you how much uncertainty there is how well have we been able to capture it so 30 seconds what are your choices if you had to put your money in there Okay, great. So I can see that you are all going beyond just looking at p values, and that's excellent. So I would say that f would be the ideal case. If I got that result, I'd be so happy because I know what to do. Uh, what to do in a positive way? Because f says that fences are very effective, right? Because the mean effect size is high. The precision confidence interval is nice and uh small meaning you know i'm quite confident fences are going to be effective actually even b is okay because b says very small effect size and you know again quite nicely estimated and it's very close to zero so in b i won't choose to uh invest in fences in f i will choose so those are straightforward 
the problem is say something like c and d so again let's uh, rule out some of the others in a a is a bit tricky because in a the effect size is close to zero but just the confidence interval is so broad all the way from something quite effective to something actually counter counter effective in fact if you put fences animals somehow seem to be attracted and come and damage the fields more but the confidence interval is kind of quite equally spread on both the positive and negative side suggesting that that huge benefit is not very likely maybe it's a problem with the design maybe we need larger sample size or something like that but look at c c also has a bit in the negative side it's overlapping zero that's why we got p greater than 0.05 because it's overlapping zero meaning zero means no effect of uh, fence right but most of the values are positive and in fact a lot of the values the, the meaning the range covered by the confidence interval most of it is positive and a lot of it is in the very large effect size part so c is a place where you might want to take a risk and invest d it's nicely measured confidence interval is small and it is consistently above zero which is why we got p less than 0.5 we statistically we rejected the null and said yes there is an effect here there is a difference but the effect size is so small you have to ask yourself is it worth the money if the damage is going to go down only by so little even after i invest so much in building fences is it worth it or is the money better spent on something else so d even though d is statistically significant the effect size and confidence interval suggests that as a manager i might even prefer c to d potentially e suggests that there could be mostly a large effect but it's just not been nicely you know precisely uh, identified so the reason i wanted to show you this is that for a b c the answer would be p greater than 0.5 d e f the answer would be p less than 0.5 statistically but they represent such different situations and the actions you might take or the interpretation you might make might vary a lot and which is why over and over again what statistical ecologists emphasize is look at statistics and confidence intervals p values are a guideline they are a very useful guideline but please go with statistical the effect size how large an effect how effective are these fences you know measures like that and how precisely how confidently have i been able to measure it go with that don't go just with p greater than this p smaller than that and so on okay so i hope that came through through this discussion the last thing i want to mention is you know so we talked about how we use statistics to get effect size uncertainty measures like confidence intervals statistical hypothesis testing and the last one i just want to mention is typically we are not interested in saying this works this doesn't works we want to know the relative importance try and estimate how important is a relative to b relative to c again let me show you an example this is back to our weaver birds i thought it would be nice to just end with the weaver birds because they're just so cool so you can see this male here he is weaving it's at that helmet stage like i told you know you can actually see that chin strap and everything and he is weaving his nest and uh, you know people have found that the quality of the nest in terms of its weave can affect how well a predator can get in so a tightly woven nest actually protects um the chicks better eggs and chicks better than a loosely woven nest and you can actually see males differ in this weaving ability so you go and make a cut in the small cut in the weaver bird's nest within uh, half an hour the males repaired it and he uses all these knots and loops and so the weaving is pretty complex so imagine i am interested in asking is this weaving ability inherited is it genetics that largely contributes towards a male's weaving ability and which will really affect his uh, reproductive success how many chicks survive and females also might you know judge nests based on the quality of the weave or is it environment in the sense is it growing environment so if you are a chick who's fed well by the parents you grow up to be a hearty male you are able to find good fresh grass you have the energy and strength to weave it well 
you have the energy and strength to repair it well so it's your growing environment that's important so what i would want to do in a study like this so maybe what i do is i you know take um uh, you know clutches of eggs and then uh, i do what's called a cross fostering experiment meaning you have pa parents a and b here and parents c and d here and you take half the eggs and exchange between them so individual there are some individual chicks here from this parent uh, you know the, the of this parents genotype and experiencing this parent and uh, exper um, sorry feeding environment and some of these chicks who are now cross fostered where they share parental environment with another set of chicks but not the genetic environment so now what we've done is we basically got combinations of genetic and parental environment and now we can check does the you know is it shared genetic environment that explains your weave quality or is it shared parental environment if it's shared genetic environment then no matter which nest you are in your weave quality should be really similar if it is parental environment then no matter where you come from if you are in a nest where you get fed well you weave well the important thing here it's unlikely that genetic environment doesn't matter at all or parental feeding effect doesn't matter at all so saying that you know p less than this uh, you know zero effect p greater than that um non zero effect is actually not very interesting what's interesting is to know oh okay in this case it seems to be the environmental effect that's so important much more important than genetic effect it's quantifying the relative importance of these that's interesting not saying that one is important and another is not so again here while the p value is useful as a guideline what's useful is getting at the strengths of these relationships okay so um how do we decide what test to use i think by now it should be clear it depends on our data and our study design if we have two things we want to compare you know we we see that this thing that we measured is continuous there are two categories we would go for a t test if you know there are two continuous predictors we might go for a linear regression so if you understand your data and the design uh choosing statistical methods there's a lot of resources that won't be a problem at all it's the interpretation of effect size confidence interval p values relative importance that's the key thing not uh you know the resources for choosing methods are widely available one last point please remember again correlation is not causation especially in observational studies it's so tempting to go with this so you know here this is a very commonly shown uh figure you know showing how uh, uh if i were to represent uh, just you know if i were to directly interpret this graph i would say that you know to generate more nobel laureates what we need to do is consume more and more chocolates but right you know all of you would agree that um it's more than chocolate that goes towards uh, getting you a nobel laureate in your uh, country so with that reminder let's sum up this last part the statistical inference part i hope you realize that good study design is crucial otherwise it's garbage in garbage out i hope again i really emphasize that we need to focus on these interesting relationships the things that really got us interested in the process in the first place so effect sizes confidence intervals relative importance rather than yes significant no not significant and those kinds of dichotomous decisions p values are good guidelines but we have to go beyond that and to be really cautious about causal inferences and think of other uh, factors that could explain alternative explanations for the results we see here are two books that i found particularly useful generally which i've just put here and um, so going back you know we've covered a lot of material if you think about it we covered all kinds of points in study design all kinds of points in statistical inference uh, more than anything i think what i wanted to convey to you here is that um, we might be so excited passionate about our questions but we also have to put our effort into designing our studies well and interpreting our data appropriately 
if we want all that effort to pay off. OK, so I'll end here. And um, yeah, oh my gosh, I don't think I've ever ended like this, this at 1259. Very impressed with myself. OK, yeah, so um, you know, I won't be surprised if all of you are very tired and there are no real questions, but I'll just wait around for a few minutes in case um, people do have questions. Yeah, sure, I can do that. There are lots of different books available. These two um, are really nice. The second one is really nice uh, because you know you get these regular statistics books that um, often take up examples, you know, from the biomedical literature and so on, which are of course um, often the situations are very similar, but we can't relate to them so well. So these are really nice because they. Uh, address ecological examples and for some of these even if you don't get the book there are versions of these or examples of these together with you know a lot of them work with the R this uh, statistical software and programming language R and uh, examples are worked out online um, so you know anybody interested uh, in other books if you drop me an email I can just point you to other resources uh, both online and uh, books that you might want to look at. Uh, I think I shared my email at the beginning of this uh, workshop, so do feel free to uh, message me. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So, um let me first so because the p value you know explaining that usually um you know it would be nice to have just spent an hour just working through how that uh, framework works but let me just mention intuitively i think you're getting there intuitively what we are trying to assess is is that one result that i have i do my study only once right and i have this result could this have come up just by chance? That's what I'm trying to assess. Could this have come up just by chance? Or is A really related to B? Like, for example, males being more aggressive in low uh, in high threat versus low threat situation. But how do we assess whether this one result could have been uh, come, you know, could have come from chance? Because if I could have done this study thousand times, what would happen if there's truly no effect? If it's just by chance? If I did this study a thousand times, what would I get? I'd sometimes get a small because, you know, I'm never going to get exactly zero. So sometimes I'm going to get a value that is, you know, 0.5. Uh, you know, sometimes I'm going to get a value that is minus 1.5. Or, you know, I'm going to get values on both sides of zero kind of equally if I do the study over and over and over again. And there really is no pattern. This truly you know, if, you know both males behave the same way no matter the threat level. But of course, I do my study only once. So given that I do my study only once, what I'm trying to judge is, is the value that I got extreme enough, large enough that it couldn't have come up just by chance. That's what I'm trying to judge. If it falls in the tail of the null distribution, it will mean that it's so large that it's unlikely to have come up by chance. If it falls bang in the middle of the null distribution, it means just by chance I can get values like this. So the p-value technically is probability of getting that statistic and values more extreme. So it's the probability of getting statistics a statistic at least as extreme as the value I got under the assumed null hypothesis. And the way we interpret it is if that probability is very large, it's falling bang in the null distribution. So, you know, just by chance it could have come up. 
if it's the probability is merely very small it's falling in the tails of the null distribution so if i have my statistic here this is the null distribution this is my uh, whatever that statistic is this is zero here if i get a value here the probability of getting you know this value or something more extreme we typically do a two, two tail test we look at both negative and positive values this probability is very large so even under the null it could have come up quite plausibly on the other hand if we have this situation and you know we find that the value falls here this is zero uh, it's a horribly drawn thing sorry the probability of it occurring of values at least as extreme under the null this probability is very small so we say okay the null doesn't seem to represent this well it we make the inference uh the important thing to remember is that quantitatively all we are getting is p equal 0.035 or some value like that after that everything we do is our subjective inference so we are saying if it is smaller than some cut off value i am convinced that there is really a difference if it is larger than a cut off value i am convinced that it could have just come up under the null uh so it's just <coughs> an outcome at random those are subjective inferences quantitatively all we get is probability of this value and more extreme value or more extreme values under the null i hope that answered your question Okay, so yeah. So if there are no other questions, then uh, let's uh, stop here. Nitin, there are no uh, nothing else from the YouTube thing, no? Yeah, no. You can have just answers to the questions that we have asked. Oh, excellent, excellent. Okay, yeah. Okay, so thank you all for uh, your attention for uh, uh, quite a long time now. It's uh, more than three hours. I hope this has been useful. And like I said, do write to me. if you you know need more help with any uh, answering any of these questions or just getting at more material okay great hope you have an excellent afternoon uh, set of afternoon sessions and uh, tomorrow also let's end here then uh, nitin you know if there are any announcements or anything or can we just uh, we can end the session no for this afternoon hmm to yes yes with communication communicating yeah so we have to be back uh, like come back to like 10 minutes before so that you can be taken in yes yeah absolutely and like i said any questions regarding that uh, careers in ecology you still have time put down your thoughts what would you like to know from all these uh, ecologists in very very different backgrounds how they got there or uh, you know particular careers that you find interesting do jot down your questions and send them to tanveen and seshatri i think that will be very helpful um for everyone okay see you then see you in the afternoon